All right. Are we are we ready to go, Seth? I guess so. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Seth, and I'm a cartoonist uh, published by Drawn and Quarterly. I do a book, uh, a um, periodical called Palookaville. And um, today I'm going to be talking to Adrian Tamine. I was going to say, uh, first of all, my current book, uh, Clyde Fans from Drawn and Quarterly from last year. And this is Adrian's current book, which is The Loneliness of the Long Distance Cartoonist, just being released right now. I met Adrian, or first um, became aware of Adrian, I guess, back in the early 90s um, through his mini comics. Chester Brown, I think, introduced me to them. And um, we were both like uh, blown away by how talented Adrian was at such a young age, how well he could write, how well he could draw. And we were both very extremely pleased when Chris Oliveros took him on at Drawn and Quarterly. Not long after that, I can't remember how long it was, um, I went on a book tour with Adrian. That's where I first met him, I think. Um, and we spent, uh, I think, a couple of weeks together on that tour. And that was um, where we became good friends. Um, I still consider Adrian one of my best friends. But in those years since that time, he's gone on to produce a rich body of complex, subtle work. Books like uh, Sleepwalk and Summer Blonde, Shortcomings, Killing and Dying. And of course, the new book, that's what we're here for, <laughs> the new book. And so, um, so we're going to have a little conversation, just uh, informal. And the first thing I'm going to ask you, Adrian, is um, the new book's a lot about being a cartoonist. And it's a lot about promoting your work as a cartoonist. I mean, it's full of signings and book tours and events. And now here we are talking to each other on a computer screen, <laughs> like going nowhere. Like, how do you feel about this uh, experience of like your book coming out in the middle of this uh, chaos? Uh, you know, we started planning the whole tour um, long before any of this, uh, any, of, any of the lockdowns began or anything like that. So I was all set to spend the spring and summer. I'd mentally prepared myself for this, to go to Comic-Con, to travel around. We had a had a two week sleepaway camp for our oldest daughter arranged and everything. Um, and, uh, you know, so when when it was finally clear that it was not just going to be delayed or altered or postponed, but actually canceled, I think I had like, you know, maybe one day of, of being a little disappointed or upset or something like that. Um, and then you know, quickly came around to it and actually started to feel like um, this would be one of the scariest books to have to go out and, you know, promote <laughs> with people. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm sure the number one question would, would just keep coming up like, who's this person? What's this scratched out name? And then they would shout out a guess and then my face would <laughs> indicate some kind of response somehow, whether I said something or not. Uh, yeah, so, I can guess who everybody was. Yeah, I mean, you knew. <laughs> so it's okay. <laughs> I thought you were doing a good job at trying to hide people's identities, but certain people, it was like, oh, that's that's dead, dead giveaway. <laughs> uh, I've had some uh, incorrect um, apologies, though. There have been a few people oh, yeah? who, who've reached out and said, "Boy, uh, I feel really bad about how you portrayed me in the book, and I'm sorry I was that way." And I'm thinking, you're, you're not who I, <laughs> I had in mind. No, it's funny when you make, when you do something like that, where you have a disguised character or something like that, it's like, it leads to a lot of misunderstandings. I remember when Dan put out, uh, Dan Klaus put out that um, story, is it gynecology maybe? Yeah, yeah. It's the character uh, with the round glasses in it. Yeah. He sent me an email like very quickly after that, like to apologize. This is not you. <laughs> not you. It's like it hadn't occurred to me. <laughs> right. it might be me. And then immediately I was like, oh, well, it's definitely me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's better just to say nothing, right? Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm I'm uh, pretty well adapted to this. Um, I'm basically on vacation with my family right now, and I just had to duck away for an hour to do this instead of being halfway across the country 
by myself. Um, yeah, do you like traveling around for this sort of stuff at all? Is it a relief in a way? You know, normally no. Um, after five months of being home alone with the kids uh, while my wife works full time, I wouldn't mind a few a few dates on a tour, you know, out in- I understand. In, eating eating uh, in a restaurant alone and <laughs> sleeping in a hotel room or something like that. But um, for the most part, um, you know, I, I kind of try and do as little traveling as possible. I, I, I would rather be home as much as possible. And like I said, I'm, you know, adapting. And, and in some ways I am enjoying just only having to talk to you or that's what I'm thinking yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah, I know. I feel the same sort of thing. I mean, it's funny, I think as cartoonists, like we have, a, or maybe this is true of any kind of authors, it's like these, where you go out and do promotion is a strange thing. Very few, yeah. very few jobs require, well, maybe business too. You go out on your own and stay somewhere by yourself. Most people, when they travel, they go with their family or their spouse. And there is kind of an odd experience that's good and bad of being out traveling around on your own. It yeah. does put you in touch with yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was, uh, when I thought I was going to go out on, on the book tour, I had this fear that um, the experiences on this current tour would start to eclipse the material in the book. And I think, oh, no, hold the presses. This is, this is a better humiliation or something like that. You must have already felt that there was a ton of material to draw from. Like, how did you even narrow it down? Yeah, this is, you're right. This is the first book where I actually felt like I was trying to condense and edit um, that I could have gone much longer. You know, usually I have the experience of like trying to pad out a book. Like I'm on the phone with Tracy, like, can we get a thicker paper stock? And, and what if I do two sets of end papers and then two title pages? I'm really trying to pad it out. Um, and with this one, uh, yeah, it just, it, it was almost like I had, I could have kept going and I could have done five anecdotes per year or something like that. But yeah. I felt like I was really pushing the limit of, of what, what people would have a <laughs> appetite for. <laughs> well, here's the question. You said the word yourself a minute ago, humiliations. Yeah. The book's full of humiliations. Yeah. <laughs> Is it inherently humiliating to be a cartoonist? What do you think? How well, do you feel? I think there's something in there. And this, it might be just that don't you always feel as a cartoonist, you're kind of apologizing for being a cartoonist all the time, that there's something inherently like frivolous or stupid about the idea of being yeah. a cartoonist? But is, is that just our generation? I wonder if, um, you know, a, a, a younger cartoonist right now is thinking, well, I've never felt humiliation. I've always yeah. been very proud to be a cartoonist and the world- They might feel better. I mean, we were still in that first generation or so of cartoonists who started to try and do serious work with comics. I mean, even a guy like Charles Schultz, who was one of the richest men in the world and had his work hanging in the Louvre, still always seemed to be kind of apologizing for doing a little strip about kids that was funny. Yeah. And it's like he didn't like, it didn't give him self-confidence or, or it didn't raise up the medium somehow. Yeah. Well, it, it, it did. We, we're, we're benefiting from, oh, we from, are. from his we work. Are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if he, I, I, if he the book that. is certainly full of, of like, you know, hard to forget experiences for you. Well, bit. how about, how about the ones where that we, we shared? I, I, I thought it would be fun to talk about the, uh, where the, some of the parts where you show up as a character. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. I hope, I hope you were okay with the portrayal. Oh yeah, totally. I mean, I, I came off fine. There was nothing embarrassing in what I was doing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Did you deliberately link showing um, Frank Miller first and then having his poster after that? It was, it was a nice uh, serendipity. I, I, I you know, he, at, at the time he was just, you know, when we, when that poster showed up, it didn't even occur to me like, here's another Frank Miller experience because everything was a Frank Miller experience. Yeah, it's true, he was so big then. Yeah, it just, it didn't, it didn't stand out at all. But when I was putting this book together, it did seem funny that those things I could kind of make them seem like they happened back to back. And in a way, I think that sort of captures, at least didn't, to me, it felt like everywhere we turned, there was a Frank Miller poster yeah. or, or he was at the event. Different time, it really was. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. I mean, I forget, like often forget how young you were when you came out on that book tour with me. I was already 
like I'm not sure how much older I am than you, 10 years, something yeah, like that. Yeah, maybe. At least. Um, so, I mean, you were like 18 years old or something? I was in college, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I think I was maybe a little older, maybe 20, yeah. Okay. I mean, you still feel the same to me. It's funny, yeah. but when I think back, I realize like you were just a kid, really. Yeah, I know. It's been a weird experience for you touring around with a book at that age. It was. I mean, and, you know, I have to say, and I feel this way towards a lot of the cartoonists who are still my friends, but uh, especially you, like, I just am always, now that I'm an old guy and I look back at the time, I'm just so impressed and 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 grateful that you guys, uh, you know, took me seriously and, and, and treated me so, so kindly. I, I don't know that I would have that in me now if, um, if uh, you're a good kid and you were super talented, I, I mean, know, but but be that kind to a 20 year old myself now, either. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, um, but it was it, it was strange, and I think uh, you know, you'd, you'd had some experience with that, you'd gone out and promoted your work, and oh, yeah, you'd had a whole crap. whole other career in a way, yeah. too. Well, that, that kind of promotion in those days. Like, um, you know, you remember, like you show up in town, you're sleeping on somebody's floor, somebody who probably doesn't really want you in their house. <laughs> you know, the terrible signings where two or three people show up. Yeah. I mean, I remember that signing perfectly, the one that you've got in the book, because yeah. I remember the mortification of that signing of having to, you know, I don't want to spoil the joke. Let's no, just, please, let's, let's, let's talk about it. Go ahead. I mean, like having somebody actually have to call people to come <laughs> to the floor, you know, it, that, it was, yeah, humiliating. For sure. On on the other hand, yeah, it was humiliating. But as I was working on that story, I had the feeling of um, that was kind of a sweet gesture from that store owner. I yeah, mean, was kind, very kind of him. He yeah. was a kind guy. I won't mention his name because I don't want to like. Uh, you remember it? You remember his name? Well, I'm pretty sure I remember which shop it was and which I guy do. It was. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember going out to dinner with him and another guy. I think afterwards. Mm -hmm big part of those tours too is going out to dinner with the comic shop owners well and that's why you have always been my favorite uh tour partner because you have this amazing knowledge of comics in general like i have a kind of a narrow experience and, and interest in comics that doesn't always overlap with a comic shop owner whereas we can sit down at dinner and i'll be burnt out from travel or the event and you and that comic shop owner can talk about Herb Trimpey or... <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's like it's, uh, I was raised somehow like by a terrorizing father that has made me feel required to give a conversation no matter what. So yeah, so like three hours of discussing who inked, you know, Kirby in 1963, yeah. the price you pay for that. <laughs> but, but the fact that you have that knowledge to draw upon is amazing. Like no matter how generous or polite I'd want to be, I, I wouldn't have that wealth of knowledge to, to draw upon. So it was always great that um, really in any situation, even if it was with a comic shop owner in, in Albany, New York, or uh, a bunch of European artists over in Portugal or something like that, I could always kind of recede and <laughs> drink, my, drink my wine or whatever while you could yeah. keep the conversation going. <laughs> that was a big shift, I think, in the comics, uh, in our era of comics is shifting from the North American comic shop to going to the European festival. Oh my God. That's a big shift in like, you know, well, and how you were treated as an author to begin with, but I think also as the art form had changed too. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was a whole new territory of ways to make our hosts hate us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah, there's, yeah. Those, not those stories didn't all get in there. I know. I can think of a few of those. Yeah. I, <laughs> The most famous one to me, which involved the uh, the concert uh, tickets we wouldn't go to. Oh, well, that was American. That wasn't your I was just going back to one of the ones I recall the strongest of people who are going out of their way for you and you will not go to this concert that they bought your tickets for. How did I forget to put that in the book? I thought about it. Yeah, I thought I'm... it was a given, but maybe it was too obvious who was who. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. So I, we... we, I we... the band. We should, I was going to say, we shouldn't say the band then, right? Exactly. <laughs> uh, but, but, but didn't our hosts eventually show up in makeup? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they were completely done up in full cosplay. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> that, that was, that was, that was up. <laughs> that 
was an American experience, but uh, once we started getting invited to things overseas, it was kind of like a whole different ballpark, both in terms of, you know, how we were treated, which was wonderful. Um, yeah. But also uh, a whole new kind of wealth of expectations or, or yeah. thing, thing, invitations that we had to turn down. I think here in the North American market, back in those days, we were kind of like weirdo artists, you know, doing underground comics. So we'd show up in a mainstream shop and be considered a bit odd. Yeah. To Europe, we became like the ugly North Americans. Oh, yeah, I That's know. We wouldn't go naked into the sauna. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. <laughs> we wouldn't get in a little boat to paddle out in the middle of the night to a sauna. Right, exactly. <laughs> at, at midnight, even though it's winter, we're going to get in a little boat and row to a island with a with a uh, communal yeah. nude, nude song. <laughs> the wrong guys. It's like they picked the two most uptight guys in North America. It's like they should have got Chester Brown and, uh, you know, who's up for anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm sure now when they invite young cartoonists over, it's just like, when when can we get to the, the nude sauna? Yeah. <laughs> I'm already nude when they get there. <laughs> uh, or a lot of them. Um, nightclub stuff a lot of like a uh, european disco oh yeah we probably <laughs> call that night when we were dragged from club to club yeah like reluctantly yeah to and finally, you... i think i had to say no yeah Going you went back to the hotel again once again i got to to hide behind you uh because yeah. i was burned out after the first club <laughs> club <laughs> and finally you snapped which which i yeah. i greatly appreciate <laughs> I have a little boiling point, but it, it eventually happens. <laughs> five <laughs> five nightclubs, yeah. We've been joking a lot, but the truth is the book takes, you know, it gets more serious as it goes along, I find. Yeah. It, it's interesting that, like, I think, you know, there's a, a series of anecdotes, and to some degree it starts out humorously, but by the end of the book, it's taken a turn. Yeah. And was that planned, or is that just the way it worked out? Um, you know, I think for a long time... Like for years, I had a vision of the book that was just comprised of those funny anecdotes. Like it was almost like a, like a comedy sketch show or something. Sure. Where it's just one little punchline after another. Um, and then kind of because of what's depicted towards the end of the book, it sort of um, gave me the idea of how to structure this book in a different way. Um, and, you know, also I'll mention that um, I don't have like a, a studio that I work in. I just have a desk set up in the corner of, of, uh, of, of our bedroom uh, that I share with my wife and she gets to, you know, see whether she wants to or not. She sort of looks at whatever I've been working on each day. And um, I think I was about halfway through the book and she was just standing there kind of looking at the latest gag that I'd done about getting embarrassed in some way. And she just, she wasn't laughing and she just had kind of like, kind of a blank reaction to it. And uh, she said, you know, I, I, these are all funny and everything, but I know you said that this was going to be like 170 pages or something like, is it just going to be this over and over? <laughs> just what you want to hear. Yeah. And so it was a relief when I could say like, no, no, I've got a whole plan and it's going to evolve. And I think, um, you know, when I first mentioned this book to, to our publisher, um, uh, I, I didn't want to let them see the pages that I'd done already uh, because I felt like to just read the early part or just to read the later part would just feel incomplete. And I just really wanted the whole thing to be read intact. Um, so I kind of, as much as possible, I asked them to just hold on to the pages until the whole book was done because I thought it was important to to have both both aspects of the story. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I... I didn't know where the book was going when I was reading it. And I read it in just one chunk. I mean, I poured through it. Mm -hmm. And um, I really liked the way that it subtly changed tone throughout, throughout the read. By the end, I thought, like, it did represent a maturing process. Mm -hmm. like, that's what was interesting about it. I kind of did feel the sense of going from being young to being older. Yeah. Um, do you feel like you've matured as a person, like, as a cartoonist? It, like, do you feel like a different person now? than when you were 25 years old? That's a hard question. Um, you know, I look around at my life and I'm kind of, uh, you know, faced with, with, with pure, pure, 
Hey, you did the Donald Trump cup thing. I thought of it as I was doing it. I thought I must be getting old. I just <laughs> I did the Donald Trump. <laughs> um, you know, so I, I see how different my life is living in New York with uh, a family and um, yeah, but I don't know. I, I was, when I was working on this book, I think it was, it felt weird reliving the, the, the really early stuff, the childhood stuff. Um, but it was not hard for me to put myself back in the mindset of the, the 20 year old to, it's sad to say, but. Um, no, you know. I understand. I mean, you still feel like the same person to me. Yeah. But I know that, like, I know many years, like, I don't know, 10 years ago or something, I was talking to some, to a girl who had been my girlfriend when I was like 20. And I said to her, do I feel like a different person to you? And she was like, no, you seem exactly <laughs> the same. And I thought, I feel really different to myself. Oh, is that right? And I thought, can you change? Is it even possible? Or is it all just kind of an illusion inside your own head? Like mm -hmm. you have a certain personality, a certain worldview, and you just, you're stuck with it. I mean, I definitely am of the, the, the belief that there's some sort of uh, core core person and there's these layers of experience that kind of get piled up on top of it and i hate to say it but i think what some people might see as uh an evolution or maturity for me is more just like me through experience learning how to present a better facade yeah. <laughs> no it's true i mean if it's one thing you learn as you get older it's how to like control your behavior how to like be less enthusiastic or mm -hmm. you know how not to give things away so easily it's yeah it, it, they are layers of of artifice for sure but I'm, i bet as a father you can see in your kids like there's something there that's just that's who they are yeah yeah well they they've played a a, a huge role in that and i was actually just talking to someone else about this about like some of the uh little anecdotes that are in the book that i think people have brought up like well when you're at the pizza restaurant and you whatever, that, that, it, that, that scene shows sort of a, a, a maturity or something. But, um, you know, to clarify in that anecdote, um, in my head and in my heart, I really was thinking like, hey, if you're such a, a big fan of my work, then why'd you bring me this nut <laughs> pizza? <laughs> but but, but yeah. because my kids were watching me, I smiled and, and behaved yeah. in, in a more socially appropriate way. But um, it wasn't like, my heart had completely changed and I, and I just naturally did the right thing. It was definitely, I felt the eyes of my children on me yeah. and, and, and put on this veneer of responsible parent. <laughs> Speaking of your kids at the end, I'm not going to give anything away, but there's a letter you write yeah. that involves your kids. Was that an, did you actually write that in real life at that time? Is that the real letter or is that's that not, what you wanted to write? No, that's not, that's not the real letter. It's um, because my, what I was doodling and writing in my uh, sketchbook that I brought with me would be kind of I incoherent and illegible to anyone else. Um, and there was a lot of scratching out and, and kind of trying to, to reword it. Yeah. But um, mostly, I mean, I, I think that's the, the, the cleaned up and more eloquent version of, of is something. That, is that in the book because you want them to read that when you're old or gone? It's a little bit. There's, uh, yeah, that letter and then the, the kind of monologue that I give to Sarah at the end, yeah. I think are both things, um, they contain things that uh, I'm, I'm ashamed to say probably have not been comfortable for me to say directly. Sure. And, um, you know, uh, I, I don't want to, I, I didn't want it to, 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 for my kids to have some sort of experience of always wondering like I wonder what he really thought about me or something like that you know I, I thought it was a good chance to actually commit to it and have it on paper and um you know Nora has actually already read it um okay. yeah and and I guess May can read it whenever she's interested or or able <laughs> but um yeah it was it was a I, I sort of saw it as an opportunity to 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 express some things to the people that mean the most to me that um you know, because of my personality, it's, it's not always easy. It's funny, like, um, I sometimes wonder about this, like being an artist, you have this, or a writer, whatever you want to call it, there's this outlet you have where people 
see you in a different way than if you didn't have that. If you were just, you know, if you were just a graphic designer or yeah. I worked in a store or something, the people around you wouldn't know you. Yeah. They know you because of your work. It gives like, I'm not sure how regular people get along in the world <laughs> without having this secret way to put out like your thoughts and, you know, to like, I don't know, recreate yourself in some way. Do you, uh, do you feel like there's things in your books that you're kind of doing similar? Like you're sort of sending out a, a message in a bottle or something? Yeah, or? absolutely. Even if it's just, I'm not sure who I'm sending it to. It's like, there's, there's a kind of thing like where you're, I don't know, you're, you're trying to like restructure yourself in some way through the work to explain yourself to the world. Yeah. Um, right. Like you wouldn't be doing that in any other way. Like when I met Chester Brown, I always think of Chad as the perfect example. It's like, I already knew his work. So when I met this guy who I thought was a, a total weirdo, um, I would have like, you know, talked to him for five minutes and then I have been like, I will never see that guy again. No, no. Knowing the work, I already knew he was a remarkable person. Yeah. So I took the time to get to know him. Yeah. But that makes a tremendous difference on how people view you. Yeah. No, right. um, imagine if you uh, had just, if, if Chester and Joe, Joe Matt, were just guys that you saw at a party or something and they were yeah. looking over at you. <laughs> yeah, I would have been out of that party so fast. <laughs> Joe, Joe Ullman said to me the other day, he said like, uh, he congratulated me for being the normal one. <laughs> and I thought, I thought, you know, if I didn't know those two guys, I'd be considered a weirdo. That's right, yeah. That's those two guys, I'm the normal, well-adjusted one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> true. I agree, I agree with Joe. <laughs> Um, let's see, what was, I was going to ask you something here. What was it? Um, oh, what was it? Sorry, I got off track. We're talking Sorry. about myself. No, that's good. Yeah, I wanted to know, like, yeah. So did you start this, like, you talked about the structure a little bit. Yeah. Did you, um, did you start it like a sketchbook kind of idea with no real intention of where it was going? Or did you really plan it like a book? I planned it out in my mind, but not on paper. So... Okay. I had a rough idea of where I was going um, and what I wanted to include. I think I might've had like a little list of, oh, the scene in Penn Station or, or something like that. Just little one phrase things that would trigger my memory. But I really just approached each chapter or story one by one. I was like, okay, now I'm gonna write about the Nutella pizza or something yeah. like that. Um, and the nice thing about not um, serializing this in comic book form first was I didn't have to think about page count at all. Yeah. So there was no thought about like making it fit into 24 pages or 32 pages. I just could just keep going at the pace that felt right and um, just let the stories breathe as, as much as necessary, I think. Um, and yeah, th this is the least planned book I've ever done, which, which was fun. I, after, yeah. after working on killing and dying for, for so long, and that was, if anything, it was overly planned. It was so thought out and so many drafts and, and that's interesting. Yeah. That I really didn't want to do that again. Um, especially at, with, with the kids at, at the age they're at. Um, I wanted to be able to do something that if I needed to, I could sit down for an hour and actually accomplish something. Um, were you enjoying drawing it? I was for the first time in a while. I would say it's like, I wouldn't say it's looser, but it, it is more, um, it looks less, planned sort yeah. of you were enjoying the drawing on a more visceral level than like charting every detail out yeah i mean part of it was just letting myself off the hook in terms of measuring out perspective and backgrounds yeah. and getting references for cars and all that stuff and just sort of just trusting myself to at least at the bare minimum communicate what i need to and 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 feeling okay uh with that um and also it was a, a, a change in, in tools too. Like in the past, I've gotten very fussy about using an expensive brush with a bottle yeah. of ink. And then I'm worried that the, the, the ink is gonna dry and mess up the brush and if I have to take a break or anything. And so this was all just drawn with, um, I mean, I still had a bottle of ink. It was like a, a, a dip pen, but certainly more forgiving than, than a, a fancy sable hair brush. So just to be able to just kind of work without thinking about the tools and just working on, yeah. on on sketchbook paper you know i'm not thinking oh here's another 20 dollar sheet of bristol board that i just wasted or something like that it felt yeah, funny 
we're from a funny generation. I don't think young cartoonists think in the same way we do because we've got this like craft aesthetic hanging over our heads that we're supposed to be producing the work like in some prison where you do everything perfectly. Yeah. And every step where we loosen up to try and enjoy the process is like pulling teeth. Yeah. I feel like a lot of young cartoonists are just like, I just draw it with a pencil and then scan it. Or yeah. I, uh, you know, I don't even draw it. I just have a tablet or they don't, it's like, they're not sweating out these kind of old standards of like, you're supposed to use a sable brush and the right ink. And, and if you don't, you're cheating. Mm -hmm. um, I find like lately I've been drawing so much stuff in magic markers. I feel like I'm almost ready to just quit using brushes entirely. Yeah. And yet there's such guilt over it. Yeah. Well, but yeah. If, it, if it makes you feel any better, you kind of started pushing those boundaries before me and were a big inspiration to me in that regard. Um, oh yeah. Like I think, uh, well, if anybody's watching and doesn't know this, I'm sure you already do, but Seth has a, an ongoing comic called Palookaville. And lately he's been serializing a, a memoir basically called Nothing Lasts. Um, and that was a huge inspiration for me because when you started doing that, I mean, of course there's a part of the, the artist inside of me that noticed like, it's not as lushly drawn and, and it's not um, as smooth. And, 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 but at the same time, I had that kind of shiver down my spine where I realized like, not only is this still effectively communicating everything that it needs to, I actually feel a little more attached to it, I think, than if it was drawn in a perfectly slick way. I, I know exactly what you mean. Um, it's funny that it's just so hard to let go, though. Yeah. I'm starting a new book right now, and my, my big torn thought is, do you do it in the full, hard-as-you-can style, or do you do it in an easy-does-it style? I know. I admire both. I mean, we, yeah. have, we have friends in common who I know right now are working in, if anything, a more elaborate and, and precise mm -hmm. style than ever before. And yeah, it's true. It blows me away, and I think people will respond wonderfully to that too. Um, uh, Julia, sorry to cut in here, but Julia says uh, that we can, you know, if we want any questions, we can ask for them, but otherwise we can just keep talking. Okay, yeah. Well, if anybody really has a desperate question they want to ask, go ahead. Okay, that's a good idea. We've still got a good 10 minutes or something. So okay. let's just keep chatting away. Yeah, good point. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, the, the psychological aspect that you're talking about is huge though. Like, um, yeah, I've, I'd, I'd say going back to Killing and Dying, my previous book, I started using a combination of the fancy brush, but I would also use these um, basically like felt tip pens, this, these like pit markers. And I mean, I felt guilty using them. I felt guilty like throwing them away after a few uses because I'm used to having tools that just last forever. So the idea of just having like a stockpile of these plastic pens that you use for a little bit and then just yeah. kind of literally throw in the trash. And I kind of look down on people who were drawing with magic markers too. <laughs> especially, especially when you'd see somebody who was doing like a brush style of art, yeah. but with magic marker where they were yeah. faking it. Yeah. And I'd be like you're faking a brush line, use a brush. Yeah, yeah. I'd already be like, well, you're not a real cartoonist then if you can't use a brush or whatever. But of course that's absurd. Yeah. Us complaining that, you know, I don't know, that Paul Clay, you know, he wasn't drawing the right way or something. It's yeah. Like, well, and also, I don't know if you had this experience, but when I started easing up on myself a little bit and using those markers or sometimes using a brush pen or, or whatever, no one seemed to notice. Like there wasn't a single, <laughs> there wasn't a single person who said, hey man, where's the Windsor and Newton series yeah. seven brush? <laughs> yeah, nobody cares at all. The funny thing is, except for like other cartoonists, I, I generally think people don't even really notice the art if you're doing a good job. Yeah. They just read the story. Yeah, I, I think another turning point for me was um, a long time ago when I had more, <laughs> more time and, and disposable income. I bought a little bit of original artwork by Alex Toth off, oh, yeah. off eBay. And when I got it, I was just like, this is incredible. It looks just like the, the, the printed work that I've loved so much. And I'd say within a year or two, it had faded to purple. Wow. And it was very clearly just like a, like a not even a Sharpie, but just like some yeah. kind of like a flare pen or something like that. And I was like, you know, it printed great. 
it, yeah. it might it might not hold up as as archival or whatever, but um, the printed artwork looks great, and that's really what more people are going to see. That's totally true. I mean, I do think that it's a, it's been a good process for me to discover that it's you know like it's really just the experience of what you're communicating that counts. It's yeah. like surface is important to some degree, and I think maybe it's a process you have to go through to get to the point where you can let go. Yeah. But I do think you know. We're running out of time too. We're yeah, out of time. Right. Yeah. I think can't take 20 years. Yeah. Well, but you've also probably thought about this too. But there's there's also that other that other barrier where if you go too far and it's too yeah. loose and too sloppy, average person will just gloss over it at the bookstore. Like it it won't grab them. It's funny. Yeah. I mean, there is there's probably some sweet spot in cartooning where it has to be a certain level of competency and clarity for it to work. I mean, we've all picked up a mini comic that has been kind of amateurish and you read it and you said, that was great. Yeah. But then you've also picked up something where you're just like, this is just lazy. Yeah. This is not, I've kept, I'm wasting my time on this unless you put a bit more effort into it. Yeah, it's a fine line. And also in the other direction, I mean, the in, our, our industry has a long history of technical wizardry, like in, oh, yeah. incredible artists who know anatomy in ways that, you know, we'll never, comprehend and fold clothing folds and and now with all the you know the photoshop coloring so everything is kind of yeah. glistening and modeled and everything and there's definitely a for me at least a line that crosses in that direction where i can't read it yeah no i agree it becomes stilted and and it's it's like it's carved in stone or something it loses all the life plus unfortunately i hate to say it but most of the time when people get that obsessive about it the story isn't really that important <laughs> yeah. And a lot of the times it's just genre stuff that, you know, it's like, it might be interesting to look at maybe, but it's, you know, it's not my taste. Yeah. 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 No, I think so. Um, okay. Looks oh, like absolutely. we got a message here. A question coming up here. Okay. It says, uh, two people have asked, how much was the book planned? We were talking a bit about that. Mm -hmm. And did you draw it in the order that it appears? Oh, okay. Um, like I said, it was planned in my head quite a bit. Um, I've developed a real aversion to that experience of sitting down with a blank piece of paper and saying, I'm gonna write my next graphic novel. Like I, I will do anything to avoid that. Um, and so with this book and with uh, Killing and Dying, I've really done most of the so-called writing in my head. And it's been a really good um, alternative process as a father with, with young kids. So there's a lot of times where I'll say, all right, today I got to figure out how I'm going to end this story. I, I don't know what the, what the final punchline is going to be or something. And then I'll take my kids to the playground and I'll be pushing them on the swing or something. And I'll sort of in the back of my mind be thinking about it. And I don't know. I just, I feel like that sort of marinating process has been really useful to me. And it also frees me up in a way that then I can come home and just execute whatever I just resolved in my in my mind. Um, and in terms of the order that I drew it in, um, yeah, I think I think I drew it exactly in the order that it was printed. Okay, I wasn't sure if that about that myself. Yeah, I wondered if maybe you'd done a few pieces and reshuffled them or something. No, I, mean, I think pretty much reordered. What's that? They seem logically ordered because yeah. chronological. Yeah. Um, is there more popping up here? Let's see. Well, there is another question here asking, basically, I think they'd like to know like what, what, what kind of advice you'd give to younger art aspiring artists. Do you need a plan? Like, you know, how do you go about it? That's, uh, that's a tough question because I mean, you could speak to this. I sort of feel like the industry and everything is so different than when we started. It is. That I always, I feel like it's two different questions of, how did I get started and what is my advice to a young cartoonist now? Because, you know, actually the main thing that people always ask me about is uh, how, how did you get into the New Yorker? Like, like yeah. even more so than, than comics, people want to know how they can start doing covers for the New Yorker. And it's like the perfect example of like any advice I give based on my own experience is completely outdated. Like I've, I've told this story before, but um, the, the way I started working for the New Yorker was I was visiting a friend in New York. I was living in California at the time and I was on vacation in, in New York and I 
borrowed her phone book and looked up the New Yorker in the phone book and found their street address and walked over there. And with no security, I actually took the elevator up to the New Yorker offices and they let me in. And I just spoke to a receptionist and said, can I hand over this portfolio? Like I have like a, a, an actual folder full of samples. And he said, okay, sure. And left it there. And it had my, um, it had my fax number on it. <laughs> that was, that was the way they were supposed to reach me. And uh, you know, and, and so, so no, no part of that would make sense to someone who was trying yeah. to do it now. And I feel that same way about, about getting into comics. I'm, I'm not sure how someone, uh, maybe it's similar, yeah. but, but you'd skip the mini comics part for a lot of people and, and do, you know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'd still say it's the same. I agree with you. I would like how I got into comics would make no sense. <laughs> yeah. But, but I would, I would probably make a guess at telling people still to do basically the same thing, which is you got to figure out what you want to do, like, and just do that work. How you get it under people's noses or out to people, that's all changed. That's true. You, you get a website or you, yeah. Somehow you have to get traffic to look at your work, or I don't I have no idea how that works anymore. Yeah, but it, in a in a way, it's not much different than making a mini comic, or which I guess you could still do, and you can still go to SPX or whatever. Yeah, um, but the real thing is like following your the thread of your interest. Yeah, somehow making work and continuing to try to make good work. Yeah, over a period of time. If it if anything good comes of it, it will in theory, find its own place? Well, I think the one, now that I'm, now that we're talking about it, one thing that might be useful is just, I think that, you know, we took this for granted, but I think it might be sort of a, an annoying reality for, for a young cartoonist now is that you kind of have to do some work on spec as they call it. You yeah. know, um, you, you don't, it's, it's pretty unlikely, at least in, in the corner of the industry that we work in, that you could just go up to a publisher at a convention and tell them about a project you have in mind, no. and, then, and then they'll give you some money to execute it, you know? Well, that seems unlikely. Yeah. You have, you'd have to, you have to build a bit of a reputation somehow. Yeah. A question has come up that is a pretty good question. I don't think I've ever had anyone ask this question. It's a good one, I think. Okay. What would you tell your younger self, your younger self to do differently? Oh, well, we should both answer that. Um, um, what would you tell your younger cartoonist self? Gosh, it's uh, a good question. Um, I, I, I'm, you know, the book, my book really wrestles with this question in a way, because it's sort of a, a philosophical thing that I, I don't know the answer to, um, because I'm coming from this position now of having had a career that worked out in the way I wanted. I would think, well, maybe I should go back and tell my younger self, to enjoy life more and 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 focus more on relationships with humans than with um with your your art tools, um, but then you know there's a possibility that that that, that would have sent me on a different maybe a happier yeah. path in some ways, but I might not have the career that I have now. So I guess it sort of depends on on priorities. When you start, start changing your life when you start thinking about how it worked. I mean, mostly I can imagine there'd be all kinds of life choices I would change if I could right. tell myself don't do this don't meet this specific person, don't go right. there. Right. But I think if, if there's anything I could send back to myself, it would be a kind of confidence to pursue like what you're actually interested in somehow, to like right. try to, to figure out your own work with more um, bravado or something. It took me so long to figure out like who I was and what I wanted yeah. to do. Yeah, I mean, you, you had sort of a, a a prelude career, you know, oh, yeah. you, you were doing work that's very different than what we think of now. And do you feel like that was, you know, like this goes, this connects to the question. Do you feel like that stuff that was necessary for you to get through, to get to Palookaville? Yeah. I do. The one good thing I feel about working on like that Mr. X comic for those years was that it gave me a chance to learn how to draw and print, even though the work's terrible <laughs> without, without writing it. Like, God, right. what kind of comics would I have wrote at that age that I'd be mortified by now? Oh, tell me about it. Yeah. I can live with the bad drawings. I mean, like, that's life. But if I had wrote my own comics at that point, oh, my God, yeah. those would be embarrassing comic books. Those would be comics I'd want to read. <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, I swear, I'd be buying them back. <laughs> yeah. 
I know. Well, you 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 think of what you you looked like, how you were presenting yourself to the world physically at that time, and you imagine what how that would reflect into the the, the stories you would be writing if you if you yeah. Could. Oh, for sure. Very different. I'm wondering, I'm wondering if we're running out of time here. I think we're running out of time. Um, yeah. I, I understand that Instagram cuts us off pretty soon, but is that should should we look at this one last thing and see if okay. there's time for it? Yeah, I was kind of thinking of asking you a bit about this. They ask if you're starting, if you're feeling very visible doing autobiographical work. And I was going to say, this is the first autobio work you've done for real, I suppose, yeah. quite some time. Yeah. I mean, the marriage book has you in it, but I don't think of that as true autobiography. No, no, I don't either. I don't either. I think that that was um, completely uh, glossed over and sort of um, sanitized because you know, I knew it was, it was originally created just as like a, a little giveaway at, at, at my wedding. Um, and that's not typically the same mindset that I'm in when I'm, I'm making my regular comics. So I, I would agree. I think that this is the most real autobiographical thing that I've done. Did you feel strange about doing it again? Um, you know, I did, I think I've gotten pretty good at this mental trick that I try and do. And I've started doing it since maybe the last previous book of, of really forcing myself to shut out any thoughts of an audience or how the work is gonna be received by, by strangers. Um, if anything, when I was working on, on the new book, I was imagining um, you, know, you and Dan and Chris and Richard and a handful of our friends reading it and, um, and, and that was about it. Um, and also you know, working the way we do in, in solitude and, and also especially now promoting it in solitude, it, it, it's been fine. It's been fine. I think if I was currently sitting in front of an audience and, and we were about to open it up to, to questions or something, I think I would be a little more nervous, but, um, but no, I think it's been okay. I see a kind of an end question here coming okay. up, which is basically, are there any artists, cartoonists or books in general that you feel like you'd like to uh, recommend at the moment? Yeah, why don't, I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that too. Um, I think uh, my first answer to that is always that I'm always amazed that this is a medium where probably unlike any other, that the, the, the artists that I loved when I was 20 are still doing great work uh, yeah. and I can still be a fan of theirs just as much as, as I ever was. Um, I don't feel that same way about music. I don't feel that same way about most filmmakers. Um, True. Uh, you know, and so so a lot of the people whose influence have been very visible in my work over time uh, are still among my favorite artists. Um, but I, I, I mean, I guess I'm guessing you feel similarly. But then I do. I, do. I, I think I sometimes I think at getting to a certain age, I've reached maybe a cutoff point where I'm not as aware of who like the, the big the most current generation is. Yeah, um, I feel like I was asked to recommend some books recently and uh, and I was at home like with time to think about it, some cartoonists. And I was still like listing Michael DeForge and yeah. Mackey and, and and stuff like that. And I'm like, these are not like this year's cartoonists. Yeah. These people have been around for 10 years. At least, yeah. More. <laughs> yeah. So, so it is harder. I think I remember when I was uh, I don't know, in my in my early 30s, I met an older cartoonist I quite admired. And it was apparent to me he didn't have a clue who any of the young cartoonists were, and I was mm -hmm. so disappointed. Yeah, you thought, what a what a fool, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should be paying attention, but and maybe it's an inevitability of being an artist sitting in a room by yourself and getting older. Is that at some point you're not as in touch with the medium? Yeah. Well, a big a big factor for me was there used to be a really good comic shop that was in walking distance from my apartment. Yeah. And I go there on a regular basis. And it was a place I took my kids to and we spent time there. And just like once a month, I would just look at every new thing that had come out and I would look at it and I'd buy things. And I and when they went out of business, um, it really kind of shut me off. I mean, there's I, I could I could get on a subway and go to another yeah. store. But the, having a neighborhood place like that kind of bringing stuff to me and, and curating things yeah. was, was really important. And I wish, yeah. I wish there was more of that. Trips to the beguiling, I, I would be much more up on things. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'll make Drawn and Quarterly happy and say, I recommend all of Drawn and Quarterly's book. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, they, they've, been, they've been on a real streak lately. I, I'm excited about the, the Tsuge series, Yoshihara oh, yeah. No kidding. 
I saw the big Suge show when I was in Angolam. Oh, you did? Oh my just God. Everybody got COVID. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that was totally amazing. I, yeah. I suddenly wanted all of Suge's work and I was so yeah. glad they're republishing it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I feel like, um, the best is yet to come too. I feel like oh, they're, yeah, sure. it, it's great stuff, but it just gets weirder and more, more impressive. Um, I also enjoyed recently, I got um, a book called Portrait of a Drunk. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, I think I've seen an image of it, but I don't yeah. really know anything about it. I, I didn't, I, it, it just came to me in the mail. Uh, and, um, you know, there's, there's sort of like this threshold when I get stuff presented to me where I just sort of flip through it, or does it like, grab me and then I have to sit down and read it. And, and that one, that one did it for me. I, I, I think you'd be impressed with it. It's, um, okay. I'll it's it's it on my list. Yeah. It's, it's pretty, pretty great. Once the beguiling opens up again and I go back to Toronto and can buy some more books, it is a difficult time. Yeah. Fortunately, actually you can't, I have had the beguiling ship me stuff. So. Yeah. I've been doing that too. Yeah. So it's good. You know, you got to keep the stores going. Yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, while I have a chance, I just want to thank everyone who, not only pre-ordered my book, but also did it through independent local booksellers. Um, it's, you know, there's, we all have concerns about so many different things right now, but um, it's, uh, it, it would be so, you know, so devastating if, if these shops couldn't, couldn't survive this time. Oh, I know. I mean, it's been, the lifeblood of our careers has been these independent bookstores. Which, Absolutely. Uh, you know, and I feel such a great, sense of loyalty and connection to those booksellers. I think yeah. of it as a noble profession for sure. Yeah. And just even for selfish reasons, like we, we, yeah. love, doing them. we love being able to go there as customers. So uh, thanks, did. thanks for everyone who's, who, who did that. I appreciate it. Well, maybe that's a good point to, uh, to conclude today. I think so. Seth, thank you so much for doing it. And before we go, I just also, I assume everyone who's watching this is a fan of Seth as well, but I just want to say that uh, he's one of my favorite artists um, and I really, if you haven't already checked them out to get George Sprott, Clyde Fans, recent issues of Bill. Yeah, you got, you got to see the, uh, the autobiographical story that I'm working on, that I'm talking about. And, it. Uh, it don't forget to buy the work of this new young cartoonist <laughs> in recording, Adrian Tamine's new book, The Loneliness of the Long Distance Cartoonist. All right. Thanks, everybody. And thanks, thanks Seth. Adrian. I'll see you later.